and there we go. And we are just getting ready to get everything going. There we go. Hello, it's good to see you. Good to see you. We are talking today about the history of iridology and how it is an evolving science. And as we do this, I encourage you to ask questions, to make comments, to play with me in my sandbox so that you can make the most out of our next about 30 to 45 minutes together. Hello, it's good to have you with me, uh, Prak Ruthi. Good to see you. And Carol, thank you for being with us on Instagram. Again, I'd love to know who you are and where you're from, regardless of how you're joining me, whether you're on the webinar with me or on Facebook or in Instagram. Um, it is so good to have you with me. Do ask questions, do make comments, and let me know what your background is. Do you have any training in iridology? Today, we are going to be focusing on the history of iridology and talking about how it is an evolving science. We're going to, we need to know this because uh, as iridologists, we need to know where we've come from. We need to know where we're going. We need to understand that iridology is evolving. There is research going on and that research isn't finished. And because of that, it's very important for us to stay current with the current research, to keep up on what is happening. And it is so sad so sad to see that there are some iridologists who are stuck in the past and this includes a lot of really good people but they are not keeping up with the current research and that is a problem because it's never good to be uh, focusing on things that are outdated and that are no longer valid so again please introduce yourself let me know who you are and where you're from I'm going to take just a moment to introduce myself so you'll understand why I feel strongly about what I am teaching today. I have been a holistic health practitioner for four decades. I started in 1980 and um, I started out as a herbalist and a nutrition coach and back then I was studying Jensenian iridology. And I've watched iridology, I've watched the whole holistic health uh, industry uh, migrate. I've watched it change. I've watched it morph. I've watched it develop. There's been so much research and it's so exciting to see. I got into holistic healing because I had some health problems and the medical world didn't seem to be able to give me any of the answers that I was looking for. Actually, they gave me no answers at all that were helpful in any way. And that was when I started looking in other places. I eventually got mass, uh, master herbalist training. I've uh, got lots of nutrition training. I'm affiliated with a couple of different organizations. We'll mention those in a minute. And I am also, I've been teaching iridology for many, many years, but about four or five years ago, I decided to affiliate with the International Iridology Practitioners Association and became not only a certified comprehensive iridologist under their banner, but also became a certified comprehensive iridology instructor. I've written many books over the years that I self-published and self-distributed. Pregnancy Naturally, The Herbal Birth Kit Handbook, Healthy Kits Naturally, The Essential Guide to Nature Sunshine Products, Biokinesiology and Color Therapy Level 1 and 2, and my most recent book is The Confident Nutritionist Dynamic Iridology Textbook, which is available to students in my iridology course. I've also created and taught many courses way back when the earth was young and grass was green. I developed Herbology Level 1, which was 20 hours of herbal training for home use. And the students loved that so much that they asked for more. So we created Herbology Level 2, which was another 16 hours of advanced herbal training for home use. A lot of the students who took those courses actually went on to become health coaches. They launched from that, that position to take more training and build on it. I've also developed and taught biokinesiology and color therapy level one and level two. For a few years, I was a certified prenatal educator with the International Childbirth Education Association. So I developed and taught prenatal classes. 
And most recently, I've developed the Dynamic Iridology Assessment System, which is an IPA approved iridology course that includes what IPA calls level one and level two curriculum. If you stay with me to the very end of today, I'm going to spend just about three minutes introducing that program to you so you have a little more information about hello around the world, Kamal and prison. Great to see prison breaker. Love that. Great to see you on Instagram. Thanks for being with me today. Alrighty, so I am also professionally affiliated with the Canadian Association of Holistic Nutrition Professionals and with the Canadian Association of Natural Nutrition Practitioners and the Alberta Herbalists Association. My nutrition training comes from many different schools, as does my herbal training, my iridology training, which is what we're really focusing on today. I've studied with eight different teachers, three different styles. And that is what gives me the right to teach what I'm going to teach today. Are you ready to launch in to learn a little bit about where iridology came from and where it's going? If you are, give me a ready now in the comments box. I love interaction. And the more you play with me in my sandbox, the more you're going to get out of me. I promise you that. Alrighty, so as we look at this, we recognize that science evolves and we know that iridology has its roots in ancient culture, Egypt, India, China, Greece, doesn't some of our most amazing and insightful information about healing come from these ancient cultures. But again, we know that science evolves. We once thought the earth was flat. We now know more and we know something differently. There are people who still do believe the earth is flat and they have for some reason decided to reject current research and to not stay up with the times. But it is true that all science evolves. Science is simply the art of asking questions, right? It's the art of asking questions and doing research and investigating to find out what the best answers are. And so when we are looking at iridology, we need to remember it is a science. And because it is a science, we need to continue asking questions. We need to continue doing research. We need to evolve with it. We need to assess the current research and decide whether it's valid or not. Let's go right back to the very beginning for the, the place where most of us first heard about iridology and where it started. The story goes that Ignaz von Petschle was an 11 year old boy and he was born in Budapest, Hungary. There are so many iterations of this story, so many variations, and they all include something about an owl or a hawk, um, something about Ignatz catching, trapping, or finding this bird of prey, something about this bird of prey having a broken leg or a broken wing or the limb getting broken in the, as Ignatz was catching him. And see, there's so many variables here. Ignaz, again, was only an 11 year old boy. And so he somehow noticed that there was a line that had formed in the owl's eye. Um, rumor has it that, you know, it was just a black line that developed in the eye. And that as the bird's limb healed, this, uh, this marking in the eye disappeared. Now, there's a few questions that I have about this. And as, as I'm raising these questions, what I want you to keep in mind is that I love that Ignatz for, for some reason got really interested in that and that he began an investigation and doing his own research into iridology. But here's what we know. We know that animal eyes are very different in their surface structure from human eyes. And we know that um, we cannot then, from because of that difference in the surface structure, we cannot extrapolate that with Ignatz reported seeing in that bird's eye is going to be what happens in a human eye. Okay, so some very different, significant differences in the structure of the surface of the eye that make that kind of an extrapolation invalid. Now, the other thing that I want to know is with all of the facilities that we have all over the world, 
uh, where birds are rescued, where if you find an injured bird, you phone them, they come, they capture this bird, they take it, they nurse it back to health, they rehabilitate it, then they release it out into the wild. Wouldn't we think that with all of these facilities that are there to rehabilitate birds, that um, this would have been seen in birds more modernly, and that we'd have documentation. Prakruthi, um, go ahead and type your question in on the Instagram chat, and I will read it, and we will answer it, all right? Um, as long as it, it's got to stay within the scope of what we're talking about today, but ask your question, and let's see where we go from there. Absolutely, I welcome questions and I welcome comments. Okay, so what we need to remember about Ignaz is that whatever it was he saw or thought he saw, um, he actually, it, it stimulated him, it twigged him, it made him want to move forward and look at this some more. But again, what he saw has never been replicated. And so that brings into question, what did he see? Um, even uh, Alan Hart Jensen, who is a modern iridologist, a constitutional iridologist, uh, says this. Even August von Petschle, who was Ignatz's, a relative of Ignatz, recognized years later that Ignatz was looking at an owl's eye and not that of a human, and that he did not have the proper equipment to prove what had been recorded in the stories. It is time for iridology to move forward based on sound research. Uh, rather than hearsay. Now, he did become a medical doctor. When he started doing his iridology research, research, he was using a two power magnifying glass. So not very strong, but enough to see a little bit. He couldn't understand why some people with a particular marking in their eye had symptoms and others that had the same marking did not have symptoms. He started mapping things, getting their stories, drawing their eye photo, trying their eye photos, they weren't eye photos, they were eye pictures, drawing them in colored charcoal and things like that to start correlating data. What a laborious job that must have been. I cannot imagine drawing things by hand and and from there, then correlating the, the person's story to the eyes and beginning to correlate all the data. Oh my goodness. We now understand why people can have the same marking in their eyes and not have the same symptoms or not have the same problems because we now understand that what we see in the eye is actually inherent. It is genetic. It is not transient. It's not based on what's going on right now. Hello, Yvonne, so good to see you on Instagram. Then we move to Pastor Nils Lilliquist. And he correctly correlated the density of the fiber. So when we're talking about fiber, we're talking about these little threads that we see in the eye. He correlated the density of the fiber to the overall resistance to disease. We now call this constitutional integrity. We know that when someone has a more dense, evenly packed fiber like this, their ability to resist disease is stronger than someone who has a looser weave to the eye like this. These looser weaves do not tell us that there are problems right now. They simply tell us where there may be more potential for more problems. All right. So we now understand also um, that the eyes do not change as the result of toxic exposure. Now, Pastor Neil Lilliquist thought that if you were exposed to something toxic, it would change your eyes. So when we see, for example, in this eye that we've got this brown patch here, we've got some yellowing in here. This is not the result of toxic exposure. This is also an indication of genetic programming that teaches us where some of the potential weak links are and why they are there. We also have Emanuel Falca. There's an institute in Germany called the Falca Institute where they teach iridology. So Prakruthi says, how to diagnose appendix with iridology. We never use iridology to diagnose. 
we may see the potential for a weakness in that area, but we don't look at the eye and go, oh my goodness, you have appendicitis, you need to have that taken out. We do not see current situations in the eye. We see genetic potentials. That is a huge difference between people who practice old style iridology and people who are keeping up with the research. So Emmanuel Falca also started creating a map of the iris. He started laying a foundation for others to build on by defining what we now call constitutions. He also taught iridology. And as we mentioned, the Falke Institute in Germany is named after him. Rudolf Schnabel researched pigment. So he, he began to understand, to discover why some people have brown spots in their eyes or yellow spots or orange spots or little red spots in the, in the actual iris itself. He began to figure out what those different pigments mean and how they uh, influence what we're understanding in the eye. He also studied pupil tonus, so pupil size, pupil shape, because pupils are not round, which is a most interesting thing. And the pupils give us information as to where things may be misaligned in the spine. When we understand that dynamically, the pupil shape is dynamic, we then can understand how that nerve feed that comes out of the spinal cord uh, impacts how, how body parts and organs function. Rudolf Schnabel was one of the first to actually use a microscope to examine the iris. He was looking for detail. Hi, Kenna, it's good to see you. Rudolf Schnabel also said this, it was no easy task. And those who believe or would like to believe that handling iridoscopy, we now call it iridology, can be learned within a few weeks or even days are mistaken and do a disservice to a good cause. This is such a challenge because you will see there are a lot of really short little iridology courses out there where it's a 12 hour course or it's a two day course or a three day course and that you're a certified iridologist out of after that. Truthfully, you don't know enough after a short course like that to be doing much, at least not safely. Joseph Ongerer, Joseph Ongerer rather, uh, was a student of Schnabel's. So now we've got some intermixing the early people uh, that like uh, Ignaz von Petschle and people who came right after him. They didn't know each other. They were doing this research independently, and it's not until later that we that we were able to compare their maps and go, boy, their maps were very similar. They were coming up with very similar conclusions, which was very exciting. Angerer became a naturopath. He was concerned that so many iridologists were creating their own language. So there were all these different iridology languages. We still have a challenge with this nowadays where people call uh, a mark. Some people call a marking by a certain name. Other schools of thought call it a different name. Other schools of thought call it yet a different name. And so there's a lot of language confusion. Angerer wanted to unify the language. He wanted to make it that we all spoke the same language. What an awesome goal. He knew his students were reading books and accepting the printed word about iridology before adequate research was completed. And he refused to publish his own work until it had been analyzed and reviewed by his professional peers. He wasn't just going to produce his own his own uh, opinions on things. He wanted it to pass the test. He wanted to make sure that what he was working with and what he was teaching really would hold up. Joseph Deck was again dedicated to iridology. He was a researcher. He pioneered iridology photography. One of the first ones to start photographing the iris. And we're grateful for that. It sure makes things easier. And he was also an instructor. We're going to hear a little bit more about Joseph Deck again in a minute. Theodor Krega uh, in the 1900s, again in Germany, this is all coming out of that Central Europe, Germany area. He was a student of Anger, Deck, and Schnabel. And he felt that iridology was a, the number one assessment tool, 
but that it was best used when combined with other things like a urine analysis, hand analysis, fingernail analysis, tongue analysis, feces analysis. He thought that it would unify things and bring our understandings together. And that was pretty exciting. That's exactly how we like to use iridology now. It is not a standalone science. In 1962, he said this, I hope that a later generation will succeed in establishing a single uniform system. In spite of zealous efforts, these have so far not succeeded. And he's right. We still have this challenge even now that there are several different systems. They bear similarities, but there are enough differences that they are really their own systems. Then we have Dr. Bernard Jensen. Oh, do we love Dr. Jensen? We do. We love him because he kept iridology alive in the US during the Cold War. When research was not coming over from Europe anymore, he kept things alive with what he knew. Now, what he knew didn't continue to grow. And that's a little bit of a challenge because those who have studied the traditional Jensenian style, which is exactly where I started four decades ago, uh, if they've been stuck there, if they have not grown and progressed, well, they haven't grown and progressed, have they? They have not continued to develop. Then about 1980, Harry Wolf, who is an American-born German, got a hold of one of Joseph Deck's books written in German. And because Harry was fluent, he read the book and it was like, oh my goodness, this makes sense. So Bill Cardona, who was my instructor in constitutional, joined up with Harry Wolf and they started teaching the German style of constitutional iridology. And with this information, I was blessed then to connect with Bill Caradonna about 30 years ago. Yeah, it'd be about 30 years ago now to study with him to learn the constitutional style. And what the cons and we're going to talk about what these styles are right here. So when we look at the styles that are out there now, we've got Jensenian, Rayid, or emotional and constitutional. When we look at Jensenian iridology, and again, this is where I started. I have a deep love for Bernard Jensen. I never got to meet the man, but I know people who studied with him as, as um, first generation students with him. And I don't know of anyone who has anything negative to say about him. Such a kind, gentle, intelligent man. So the Jensenian style of iridology was originally taught by Bernard Jensen. And he taught that the iris changes when the body changes. So if we put the body through a cleanse, we'll see the eye color change. We'll see the fiber structure, or the, the way the fibers sit in the eyes change. We'll see the lacuna, or if you're Jensenian, you would call them lesions you would see them change as well as healing happened. There were a few challenges with that because it wasn't quite accurate. Traditional Jensenian iridologists have often done iris readings cold with no background information from the client. There is a well-known healer here in Calgary who has since retired where he practiced Jensenian. You would go in to, to work with him and he would look at your eyes, he would tell you what was wrong, he would give you a herbal recipe, he'd stop at the front desk and pick it up. And he did not want you to say even a word. He didn't care who you were, he didn't want to know anything about you. Not a very holistic approach. Traditional Jensenian iridologists have a very different style from the modern Jensenian iridologists. So anyone who is studying now with Ellen Tart Jensen has gone constitutional, which is really cool. The Rayad style of iridology says, teaches that the emotional traits are genetic and are revealed by markings in the iride. So the way someone who practices physical iridology would assess an eye using whatever markings they're seeing, the Rayad iridologist will use those same markings, but interpret them on an emotional or personality level. 
Readings may be done cold. Information can be gathered from the IRIDs, IRIDs and it may be combined with personal and or family history information for interpretation. So it is often very helpful to have that family history background, especially about emotional things. Hello, Rajus. Good to see you. And Nav and Daughter of the River, good to see you on Instagram. And Tara and Timothy, great. Thanks for being with us on the webinar. Rayad was originally founded by Denny Johnson. He has actually really morphed, continued his research into the emotional iridology. What he teaches now is nothing like what he was teaching 35 years ago when I studied Rayad. Jim Burgess also continues with the behavioral iridology. They have very different styles. Constitutional iridology, which is the more modern style of physical iridology, originated with Joseph Deck and others. This is based on, again, the constitutions we see in the eye. Hello, Flying Two. Thanks for joining us on Instagram. Constitutional iridology is used by medical doctors in Italy, Germany, and Russia as a screening tool, not as a diagnostic tool, but as a screening tool. It helps to point them in the right direction, helps them to understand why clients, have, why their patients have the symptoms they do. There are correlative medical studies being done. There's some great stuff being done in California right now. And periodically we get reports on how that research is going and it is very exciting. Constitutional teaches that the eyes are a reflection of the genetic structure of the body. So, and by genetic structure, I don't necessarily mean what we see physically, but I mean the genome. It's, it's about the genes that the body has and that genes can be turned on or turned off, you know, that activation or deactivation. And when we see the eyes and we understand the markings we see in the eyes, we then actually understand the questions we need to ask and we can correlate the markings and the questions, the answers our clients give us with the client's symptoms. And it gives us a much deeper understanding of our client and their health and why they've got the symptoms they've got and what we can recommend to help them. Constitutional is the foundation of the dynamic iridology program that I've created. With constitutional, it teaches us that the eyes do not give us the answers, but the eyes tell us what questions to ask. I love that about this. Um, as a Jensenian iridologist, I would tell people what was wrong with them and I was wrong a lot of the time. As a constitutional iridologist, I can ask questions based on what I see in the eyes and elicit the information I need from my clients. For example, I was working with a young girl, a three-year-old the other day, her mother brought her in. And as I did the eye photos, I asked the mom, the mom was concerned about a skin rash that this little girl had. And as we're you know, looking at the eyes and asking questions, I asked the mom, because of what I saw in the eyes, does your daughter ask for sweet things? And the mother looked at me and she said, yeah, why would you ask that? And I said, because this in her eye suggests that she is prone to blood sugar imbalances. And so we need to be balancing her blood sugars if we're gonna get, a, get control of this skin rash. And the mother was quite amazed because the medical doctors had never asked that. The medical doctors had only prescribed steroid cream. No dietary changes, no, uh, how do, what does this child eat? No concerns about allergies, nothing like that. They had just totally gone after using a steroid cream on a three-year-old child, which kind of, I get it that it takes care of the symptom quickly, but it sure doesn't cure or, or correct the imbalance. So we, uh, we know that iridology tells us what questions to ask. Other iris and sclera changes may continue to become visible with time revealing areas that may need support. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. When you were born, your digestive tract was not mature, right? We all agree on that, right? And over time, and that's why your parents didn't feed you meat and potatoes when you were a day old. Over time, your digestive tract matured and got to where you could handle more complex foods. 
when you were born, you probably had lovely, smooth skin, probably no wrinkles at all. As we get older, we develop wrinkles. Some of us develop them sooner than others. Why is that? Some of that is genetic programming. Um, I didn't have gray hair 15 years ago. I started to develop gray hair about 10 years ago. Now, why? Some of that could be under the influence of diet. Most of it is under genetic influence. So we see changes in our body that have genetic triggers. The, we see changes in the eye rides and those changes are there because of genetic triggers, not because of toxic accumulation. With constitutional iridology, background information is very important. We want to have a conversation with our clients. We want to understand who our clients are, where they're coming from, what their health goals are, and we integrate that with our iris analysis to understand who our client is. So, so important. All right. So, when I started, we're going to look at some eyes now, and I'm going to give you a Jensenian analysis versus a constitutional analysis here. So these are going to be pretty quick. I started learning iridology in 1979. Constitutional iridology had not yet reached Canada, and it was not widespread in the United States. So I studied and embraced the only thing that was available, and that was the work of Bernard Jensen. I started getting frustrated within about five years of starting this study and working with clients in the, at the 10 year mark, I was pretty much ready to just walk away from iridology because it wasn't working for me. I would see an eye like the one you see on your screen. And I've been taught that each of these loops in the eye was called a lesion which I didn't like that name. It always sounded cancerous. It did not sound good. It, it really wasn't a name that I, I liked. And I was taught that every one of these was a pathological problem that was happening in this body right now. I was taught that if we did the right things, these lesions would go away, that fibers inside, fibers would start to form inside. And that was about healing. That was all about healing. Well, as we did this, as I would do an analysis and I would say, well, you know, you've got a problem here and here and here and here and here and here. It got pretty depressing because that's a lot of problems to have. And my clients nine times out of 10 would go, no, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. So I was looking really stupid. And I was told again that these lines indicated healing. Well, OK, we now know that's not quite right. We now know that the eye is made up of layers of fiber. We know that these are not going to disappear. They may, based on the pupil side, appear longer or fatter, but they're not going away. And we know that these fibers that are under here have always been here because that's just down one or two layers in the structure of the iris. These don't indicate healing. They've always been there. I've been taught as a Jensenian that all of this uneven pigment in here meant this body was full of toxins and this person needed to cleanse them out. And that if they would do a cleanse, eyes like this would become blue. Teachers who had taught me had uh, seemed to have before and after pictures that looked convincing. Um, they showed lesions in some eyes that looked smaller. They showed eyes that looked bluer. But I didn't know anything about photography back then. And so I believed what they said. And as I put my clients through cleanses and on diets and we used supplements, what I found is that my clients' eyes did not change. I started to question what I knew. I got frustrated. My clients got frustrated because they were doing all this work to change their eyes. That was the indication that we were looking for, that they were making progress. We weren't paying attention to their symptoms. So our, our, what we were looking for was very misguided because who really cares if the eyes change? I really wanted my clients to feel better. So I was getting frustrated. I was about ready to walk away because this wasn't working. 
this wasn't working. Then I learned about constitutional iridology and I decided to give it a chance. What I learned, I learned actually the very first thing I learned, uh, learning opportunity I had, that's the better way of putting it, was that Harry Wolf had created some VHS videotapes. Did I just date myself? How many of you have actually watched a video on a VHS videotape? Have you? <laughs> okay, so I bought these videotapes. It was only about six hours of training, but the, it took me probably 25 hours to go through the first time because I'd watch a little bit, I would stop it, I would take notes, I would study it, really, really went through this. And I went over these videos over and over and added to my notes and really studied with it. And Tina says to me, yes, yes, fabulous, Tina. And so what I learned from these VHS videotapes and then later from classes when I brought Bill Caradon up to Canada twice to teach courses for us was that the eyes show us the inherent potentials. They don't show us, the eye rides themselves do not show us what is going on in the body right now. They show us what is possible, all right? So they show us where there are weak links. They show us where things have been inherited. They show us where organs may want to be out of balance and may want to be having a negative impact or a stressful impact on another organ. This is showing us information that has been passed down from the last three to four generations. I was working with a client yesterday. She lives in the US, so I've never met her face to face. We did a Zoom session. She was able to get photos of her eyes with a smartphone, which they sent to me. There was a marking in her eye coming straight down here, quite a bold marking. Now, this woman is 86 years old, and these aren't her eyes. I'm just giving you an, uh, for instance, here. But she has, has a strong marking in her eye right here. And I, and she said, what is that? And she's very afraid of it because she'd heard that the eyes are all about what's happening right now. And I said, whoa, just let, let's take a deep breath. We're going to take a step back here. I said, have you ever had a kidney issue? And she said, well, no. And I said, has your father had kidney issues? She said, yes. And I said, this is a marking you inherited from your dad. If you're 86 and you haven't had a kidney issue yet, you know, if you have a kidney issue moving forward, it's not, it, it's an inherited thing, right? And you've not struggled with that yet. So we don't need to worry about it right now. We know from constitutional, again, that this, these pigment freckles, are not the accumulation of toxins. This is not exposure to medical drugs. This is not exposure to chemicals in the environment. This shows us that an organ is prone to being out of balance and that it wants to have an impact on another organ. So what do we do with this? We don't detoxify and cleanse. I think North Americans are cleanse happy. I think they cleanse way too much. They should be focusing on what they do on a daily basis, not doing these all powerful cleanses twice a year and then going back to their riotous living. And I'm being a little facetious there. That's one of my soapboxes, just so as you know. When we're doing constitutional iridology, it teaches us to look for patterns and to understand the interrelationship of organs and that if the person is already doing things that are supporting good health, then they may be making these markings unimportant. This shows us what wants to happen. This shows us what wants to happen, that if this person is doing good, healthful things that are supporting those areas, those areas may never have a problem. The eyes show us inherent predispositions. Right. That is so important to recognize here. The old iridology on this one would say, oh my goodness, this person is so stressed out. They're going to have a nervous breakdown. Oh, look at the parasites. This person is full of parasites. Oh, we need to do a cleanse. Look at this dark brown in here. This is not good. Okay, constitutional, and that was a little facetious. My apologies if that if you studied that type of iridology, but truly constitutional iridology looks at it this way. 
these are the eye. This is the eye of an Asian woman who's in her mid thirties. She and her husband came to me because they'd been trying for three years to have a baby and they'd had no success. They had been to the fertility clinic with no success. So what I noticed in her eyes was that she has these contraction furrows. Now, if you've studied another style, you'll call these cramp rings or nerve rings. And um, these tell us that she probably burns through her B vitamins, vitamin C, calcium, and magnesium way too quickly. So she internalizes her stress. I asked her when she was here with her husband, how do you handle stress? And her husband kind of laughed. And I said, okay, you tell me the story. He said, I know when she's in stress because she comes home from work and she doesn't say a word. And he says, I get home from work first. So I cook dinner. I put her meal on the table. I know that after she's eaten, she's going to go up and she's going to have a hot bath for a couple of hours and she's not going to talk to me. I went, well, those are good ways of handling stress. Let's go in on a chemical level now. I saw some indicators here that also suggested she might have problems methylating her B vitamins. Now, when you're trying to get pregnant, you have got to have folate. And if you can't turn folic acid into folate, into the methyl tetrahydrofolate form, you're not going to have as much luck getting pregnant. So I saw that in her eyes that she probably doesn't methylate her B vitamins. Can't diagnose that because I can't do genetic testing. But there are hints here that lean that way. So I made sure that we use some of the methylated Bs with her. I also suspected from the very beginnings of a lipemic diathesis, she's only in her 30s and she's setting up a lipemic diathesis. You might call that a sodium or cholesterol ring. And so I knew from there that her liver enzymes might be having creating some issues with how she handles her carbs. So I asked her. Has, has she ever had her blood sugars tested? She said, oh yeah, the doctor diagnosed me with type two diabetes. Oh, interesting. And so of course I asked her, how frequently does she have a period? Oh, about every three months. Oh my goodness, this all adds up to PCOS, which I couldn't label her as, but I asked her, has the doctor said that you've got PCOS? And she went, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you that. Okay, well, I'm figuring this all out largely from what I see in her eyes. Now, I couldn't have arrived at those deductions using my old style iridology. I had to use the constitutional iridology. So when we came at her health from those perspectives, that she likely doesn't methylate her bees, that she internalizes her stress, that she likely has blood sugar imbalances, again, based on what I'm seeing in her eyes, we were able to do dietary corrections, put her on the right kinds of supplements. And it took us about four months to get her cycles down to 30 to 35 days, which is a pretty sweet spot when we're coming down from 90. A 90 day cycle will always be infertile, whether she's ovulated or not. A 30 day cycle has more chance of being fertile. They were able to conceive. It took about 18 months. So she was a little subfertile, even when we got things in line, but she, she conceived, carried the baby to term, did not develop gestational diabetes, which the doctors had said, oh, you know, you're at real risk. But we had her diet, we had her lifestyle all revamped. Then she had her baby beautiful baby boy, two hour labor and delivery, a little precipitous on a first one, but still got it all balanced. And as her husband said, he sent me a little um, a video and he just said, thank you so much. We, we would not have been able to do this without your help, without understanding what we needed to change because the fertility clinic doesn't care about your diet. They just want to give you Clomid or they want to do an egg harvest or they want to do IVF or they want to do IUI. So they were pretty excited about that. But it was because of what I saw in her eyes and the fact that we did it constitutionally. So the question here is, what do I think the future of iridology is? Right? Because we're talking about the history of iridology here. And I want to tell you that as long as there is good research being done, 
And as long as iridology instructors are willing to adopt and teach the new knowledge, iridology will gain respect as a valid health assessment tool, never a diagnostic tool, always an assessment tool. If we as an iridology community, however, persist in hanging on to disproved and outdated and ineffective teachings of the past, we're gonna kill iridology. It's going to come under more and more scrutiny and judgment, and it's gonna be called quackery because that's the old stuff is not valid anymore. So the choice is ours as iridologists, it really is. Get and stay current to progress the science or stay in the past to cripple it. It's pretty simple. Having said all of that, with your permission, I'd like to take three minutes, count them just three, to give you a bit of a heads up about the dynamic iridology assessment system program that is going to is taking registrations now and will be starting on September 9th. This is the only live online fully mentored course for nutritionists, herbalists, and naturopaths who want to streamline their clinical work without sacrificing client care. What I see happening all too often is that holistic practitioners see the client for the first time, and they take some information from the client, then the practitioner goes and spends two or three or four or six hours creating a protocol that they then take back to the client in the next session. The challenge is most practitioners are not charging enough to cover all the hours they spend creating the protocol, right? So they may have invested four to eight hours for that client and they're getting paid for the two face-to-face -face hours. It's not a really successful way to run a business. When we do iridology properly, we see the client, we do the iris assessment in the session, and we craft a next steps program in the session. So we get all of our work done while we are with that client. Why do we do that? Because it benefits you and your client in many ways. First off, it means you're not doing unpaid overtime work to create protocols. Second off, it helps you create programs that are simple and focused and effective that your client can actually stick with. And we build the program from one appointment to the next to the next, constantly tweaking, adjusting, and building. Because the programs are built in simple steps, individualized steps, the client can stick to the program get some progress. And as they get progress, they want to come back and work with you some more. They want to know what's the next step. How do I go from where I was to where I, I want to be? How do I get there? What are the steps? And you take them one step at a time. That creates client compliance, success, and long-term retention, which is what we need to have in this industry. We need to get rid of the one-off appointments because they don't serve anybody well. With the dynamic iridology assessment system, I've designed the course specifically for holistic practitioners. So nutrition coaches, herbalists, naturopaths, those are the people I teach in this course. I don't teach people just general public because they don't have the foundation in anatomy and physiology that they need to do iridology well. So we teach you more than one marking means one thing. We teach you what the markings are, how they interrelate, what information does that give us to help us understand why our client has the symptoms they've got, then what is the client already doing for their health? How do we build on that with what we know about our client to create success for the client? So in the dynamic iridology assessment system, I actually teach you how to integrate modalities you already have. If you have herbology, if you have nutrition, if you have aromatherapy, if you have flower essences, we work with what your background is to teach you how to integrate that into your program creation. We never ever use the eyes to diagnose. We always build from one appointment to the next. The dynamic iridology assessment system is designed to give you all of the IPA, that's International Iridology Practitioner Association, level one 
and level two curriculum to prepare you to certify with IPA if you so choose. So here we go. We are doing an info session about the course on June 30th at 12 noon mountain time. That is one hour later than what we started today. And if you would like to join me for that, you can see the link if you're with me on the webinar, it's in your chat box. If you're with me um, on Instagram or on the Facebook group, you can see the link there. And in this web class on June 30th at 12 noon, I'm going to share with you all the details of the class, how it can benefit you as a practitioner, how it will benefit your clients, what is included in the class, what is the tuition, what are the payment programs that we have, how will this course actually benefit you, right? So, so important. And I can answer all your questions about the course. Let me share with you what one of my graduates said. This is Karen Choate. She's in Michigan and she came to me as a certified natural health practitioner. I asked her, how has learning constitutional iridology helped you in your business? And this is what she said. It has helped me understand the relationship between the different organs and organ systems more in depth. Iridology also gives me an advantage of seeing the potential for different genetic traits and qualities that may be underlying. By observing the constitution, for example, you can extrapolate how the person's body will likely respond to applications of healing methods. Therefore, it has helped me to expand my knowledge and increased efficiency at providing more precise recommendations for health oriented options. So again, I, I encourage you, that's just one of my students sharing how it's benefited her. I encourage you, if you want to know more about the course, if you wanna know more about how iridology, constitutional iridology can benefit you in your practice, then plan on joining me for this webinar on June 30th at 12 noon mountain time. So for those of you who are time zone challenged like I am, that's 11 Pacific, one Central, two Eastern and three Atlantic time. Got it? Okay, <laughs> excellent. Now, I always, uh, I, if I don't check my time zones, I show up at the wrong time. I don't know if you've ever done that, but just you know, being human here and helping you to find um, get in at the right time. So with that, um, not many questions or comments coming through today. Anyone have anything they want to ask me? Any comments they want to make? I hope that seeing some of the history of iridology has helped you to see that we need to continue to go with this. We need to continue to build. And Pam, thanks for joining us on the webinar. Mm. We're just wrapping up. I think there was a time zone conflict for you there, um, but you'll get the recording link. So you'll be able to see this. And Yvonne says, thanks for the overview. Yes, Tina says, will June 30th be recorded? I might be at work. People who register for the webinar will receive the record, recording link. Absolutely, Tina. So if you are interested in, um, attending but you can't scheduling conflict in your life those things happen please do register for the webinar and you will receive the recorded link thank you so much for being with me today i really appreciate it it's been a blast and i hope to see you on the 30th if not sooner bye for now